The inauguration of a new president doesn't usually engender uncertainty in the music community and almost never fear. But this year is different. With the dawn of the Trump presidency, the U.S. Congress has already announced plans to overturn the Affordable Care Act, an action which would disproportionately affect musicians who tend to be under or uninsured as a rule. Welcome to the future of what? Today, our title seems to take on even more meaning as we look at what a Trump presidency might mean to the music community at large. What will the Trump administration's attitude be about net neutrality? What about copyright and the current register of copyrights vacancy that needs to be filled? And of course, what happens when thousands of musicians lose their health insurance? We'll talk about all this and more right now on The Future of What. You're listening to The Future of What. We're talking to Kevin Erickson of the Future of Music Coalition. Kevin, welcome to The Future of What. Thank you so much for having me. So we are having you today because you wrote a blog posting on the Future of Music Coalition's website, futureofmusic.org, about what musicians can expect under this forthcoming Trump administration. And I think this is a really important topic for our listeners because... As you point out in your blog posting, we kind of don't know a lot about what Trump's policy on on a lot of things are going to be, but we know that there are certain areas that we should really be concerned with. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. You know, this election was unlike any that I've seen in my lifetime in so many ways. You know, the, the first time we saw a presidential candidate make these kinds of explicit appeals to white supremacy. <laughs> That's just a little tiny matter of, yeah, that that's that's new. But another thing that was sort of unique about it was how little the campaign seemed to hinge on policy questions. And because I think almost everybody in D.C. expected a different outcome, there weren't a lot of contingency plans made around what a Trump administration would look like in terms of policy on the the broad range of issues that impact musicians. And so it seems like everybody I talk to, whether it's music folks or technology policy folks or media reformers, everybody's sort of in the same place of trying to construct, if not a a concrete understanding of what it's going to look like, sort of to set our expectations and know what we can be ready for and know what we're going to have to organize around in 2017 and beyond. But beyond beyond those sort of concrete policy issues, and there are a number of them that we care a great deal about, access to health care and health insurance, net neutrality, whatever the impacts might be on copyright, modernization on federal support for the arts, a whole range of things. What I say in the piece is that our greatest concern goes beyond any specific piece of legislation, and that we're just worried about our fellow citizens. We're horrified by this rise in hate crimes that we've seen over the last year by the normalization of misogynistic language. We're worried about civil liberties. We're worried about basic respect for people of color, for immigrants, for the disabled, for LGBT folks. And in terms of the artist community specifically, we're really worried about a future where artists who aren't aligned with privilege and power may not feel free to raise their voices. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's important at this moment before the Trump administration is actually in office to have some really frank discussions internally in the music community about what we can do to defend each other. And, and so, you know, I'm excited by some of the things that I see happening, by the, the way that organically artists and independent labels have been using their platforms to elevate the voices of some of those communities that could be particularly endangered or harmed to help bolster the kind of organizations that are working on these kinds of issues to be resourced and to be ready to go right out of the gate in January. Because this stuff is important because music is not just about the business. It's not just about entertainment. It's it's about a whole lot more than that. I also think that music is often a source of strength to people who are protesting. You know, I remember my dad saying to me years and years and years ago, what is this rap music all about? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I was like, well, gee, dad, that's, you know, there's a lot of answers to that. And he's like, well, what, you know, what is it these black people are upset about? And I'm like, well, 
there's a lot to be upset about if you're black in America. And, you know, music is one way of protest. Like, there have always been protest songs. Every oppressed group has sung protest songs. And I think that's an important thing to remember and something that independent labels can do right now is continue to help make those voices heard, especially in a time when we're really afraid that a lot of those voices are going to be silenced in a way that we haven't seen before, at least not, you know, in 150 years or something. <laughs> it's so horrible. I'm laughing because it's so horrible. Well, yeah. And, and, and to take a global perspective, too, you don't have to look that far back. Our friend Ian David Moss, who is a arts writer and researcher, uh, has a blog called uh, Create Equity. He wrote something really interesting, sort of laying out or what he says, I guess, is that if Donald Trump wants a playbook for bending the democratic institutions of the United States to his will, he has a bunch of recent examples from which to draw. And he goes down this list as, you know, here's what's going on in Russia and in Turkey and Hungary and in Israel. And in each of the examples that he documents ways that the arts, artists and media are among the first to be singled out when an authoritarian government seeks to impose itself on the people. So some of these arguments, you know, when Trump is going after Hamilton or Saturday Night Live or, or other kinds of free expression issues, People have said that these things are a distraction from the actual policy making, and that we should be focused squarely on what his policy plans are going to be. And from my perspective, I don't think you can really separate the two. Like the the, the attacks on artists and artists' ability to express themselves in the way that they see fit are as central to the idea of freedom. <laughs> As, as policy is, I think that you can draw a pretty straight line. And we have evidence from all around the world, I guess, at this point, that that's the case, that there's attacking artists who are raising their voices is one of the first things that happens. Yeah. And you can say the way has been paved for this for years with Republicans cutting funding to arts programs in schools across America. You know, I mean, the, this isn't like a brand new thing. Right, right. We have always worked on a bipartisan basis at Future Music Coalition. We've always been able to find people on both sides of the aisle that are responsive to these arguments, that are, that are able to see the value and support from, for the arts, regardless of what their party is. But there is a point at which the dynamics with this administration is about and how that might differ from any Republican administration that we've seen before. Like this starts to become real, real vivid. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, and one of the opportunities there is to sort of use some of the, you know, one of the reasons that it's important to be, develop a capacity. You know, this is not something that has come naturally to me. I, I approach this work as it was fine for me to be candid about it. I'm a like lefty progressive that grew up with indie rock and that's been formative for like my personal politics and my values. But it's been really like helpful for me to learn how to talk to effectively with Republicans and find common ground with Republicans in Congress, even though we might disagree on a whole range of things. And that's allowed us to get get things done in a way that's genuinely like finding common ground. You know, like an example that we always point to is like getting Sam Brown back, the extremely conservative senator from Kansas, to get on board with the idea of the Local Community Radio Act and become a big supporter of community radio. And despite not having a lot of common ground with him on a whole range of social issues, understanding that there is mutual benefit in creating infrastructure around media and letting local communities elevate the voice of their communities. You can do that and you can find that kind of common ground. And and so this is sort of a point where like working effectively with people on, in both parties of Congress. So if we do run into problems with this administration around the freedom of expression, we can get pushed back and, and, and try to hold the administration accountable using relationships in Congress from both parties. Yeah, I mean, that would be ideal. Let's talk for a second about some of the specific issues. For example, you talk about in your post that you guys did a joint piece of research in 2013 to discover how many musician respondents to your survey were uninsured, and you found that 53% were uninsured, and that was in 2013 prior to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Did you guys have any statistics on how many musicians ended up becoming covered? You know, we can only speak to that anecdotally because since the act passed, 
it's been difficult to get funding to replicate the research. Mm. But that is a really interesting research question. Anecdotally, we know that the Affordable Care Act was in, intended to target just this population, low-income, self-employed individuals and their families. But a lot of musicians fall in that category. And anecdotally, lots of my friends and peers were able to get insurance for the first time aren't able to put numbers on it at this yet. As we find ourselves defending the law now, maybe that'll change and maybe we can find the right foundation and we'll step up to fund that research. Definitely, because I I have the same experience as you. Anecdotally, I have a lot of people report that they have had insurance under the Affordable Care Act for the first time. But that's, you know, musicians in particular are an extremely vulnerable population to being uninsured. Because as we know, as recently as three years ago, a lot really were. And it's difficult in the the way the market operated in the past. So that's a really interesting, the word interesting is maybe not appropriate. That is a frightening prospect if the Affordable Care Act is gutted or repealed or whatever it is that they say they're going to do with it for musicians, because that, you know, that places them right back in the same boat that they were just four years ago. Right. Back in the same place as extreme precarity. I think that there's, if there's anything like comforting that I can offer around that, it would be that in the same way that the Affordable Care Act took a couple of years to actually implement and ramp up after it passed, it'll take a couple of years to dismantle. And so in the meantime, we're entering an open enrollment right now. And what we're telling people is go ahead and sign up, get a plan, even if it only covers you for the next year or two, it's better to be covered for the next year or two. And the other thing is that if if indeed action happens in Congress, either through the uh, reconciliation process or through standalone legislative efforts to roll back the substantive parts of Obamacare, there will be political consequences for that. You can't repeal a program that's actually helping people and not suffer some political consequences for that. So there will be opportunities to hold those people accountable. And at that point, we might be able to stem the tide, you know. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you bring up in your post that I I thought would be a great chance for us to have you explain is net neutrality. Can you just sort of give an overview of that for people who know the term but don't really understand it? Right. So net neutrality is sort of fundamental to the idea of the Internet. The infrastructure of the Internet treats all of the data that travels across it the same. So internet service providers are required to treat your content or your data the same as any other originator of content or data, rather than creating fast lanes or slow lanes. In terms of music, it means like the tiniest cassette label, the internet works as well for them as it does for One Direction. It means that artists whose careers increasingly are dependent on the internet and connectivity and the ability to reach potential audiences have at least a fair shot at competition online. And so their ability to reach those audiences isn't, is, you know, hopefully dependent upon a competitive marketplace rather than just a relationship with whatever corporation or whatever corporate partnership would happen between an, an internet service provider and I don't know, a major label or something like that. And so musicians and independent labels and other art supporters had backed this concept of net neutrality for a long time, even before the term net neutrality was made up, and fought really hard for tough net neutrality rules. For more than a decade, there's been legal battles over it. I went to the courts, went to the FCC. Finally, in February 2015, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, voted to approve net neutrality rules, which invoked Title II of the Communications Act, which basically gave them strong, forceful authority to actually make this the rules of the road. There have been a bunch of congressional attempts to roll that back or to block the new rules. There are many in Congress that take the ISP line that if, if the internet service providers can make more money by creating fast lanes and slow lanes, they should be allowed to do that, regardless of the impact on competition. But because of the threat of the presidential veto, those attempts to roll that back haven't gotten anywhere. And now we don't have that protection anymore. Donald Trump has been pretty forthright about his opposition to net neutrality. He uh, appeals to these sort of vague free market principles. His transition team point person on 
technology issues has been Jeffrey Eisenach, who's the guy from the American Enterprise Institute, which is a big elite Republican think tank. And his previous clients include people like Verizon, you know, just the kinds of companies that have a lot to gain from throwing net neutrality rules out the window. So that's a pretty clear threat at this point. Now, it could happen through congressional action or just through the people that Trump appoints to the FCC, that these protections start to be ruled back. But there's going to be opportunities for musicians to speak out about that, to continue to make the case that they've made for the last 10 years, because the FCC is built on process and data gathering. They are required to have public comment periods and they're required to respond to public commentary. And so when we get to that point, there's going to be need to be a a renewed push from the entire music community. You know, and net neutrality alone is not going to give us what we need to build a a fair Internet. Like it's, it's just sort of like the baseline that everything else is built on top of. But we need that baseline. Another issue that you don't mention in your post, but that has been coming up a lot lately. So it's on my mind is the the Department of Justice's whole thing that they're going through with the consent decrees. And, you know, the removal of Maria Palente as copyright registrar. And, you know, there's just a lot going on over over there right now. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I don't have any particular personal faith that Donald Trump understands that or knows about it. But clearly he's going to at some point have to appoint somebody to be in charge of justice. So that could make a really big difference to musicians as well. That's true. Now, the thing with with a post like the Department of Justice is those kinds of choices are not going to be motivated by an interest in these kinds of specific musician community issues. They're going to be, you know, we might end up with somebody who's great on those issues, or we might end up with somebody who knows nothing about them at all. It's just another another front that we're going to have to be watching closely. Fair enough. <laughs> we're going to have to be watching on a lot of fronts, it seems. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be a lot of juggling, a lot of vigilance, and a lot of pushing back. Uh, and I think that, and I think that musicians are, are uniquely equipped to do that. Luckily, that sometimes that these these processes can be really opaque and challenging. And just one one of the reasons I really appreciate the work that you do with this show uh, to to sort of illuminate the real world consequences of these things that are happening happening behind closed doors in Washington, because they do have impacts. It's going to be a wild until we know more about what those impacts actually are. But, you know, we're going to, we're just, we're going to continue making the case and we're going to continue insisting that musicians have a place at the table. Well, on that note, (laughs) that was a a nice place to end. Kevin Erickson is the National Organizing Director of Future of Music Coalition. Kevin, thanks again for being with us on The Future of What today. Thank you so much. That was Another Genius Idea from Our Government by Erase Arata. If you're enjoying this program, please subscribe to our show on iTunes. To find out what's coming up next, follow us on Twitter at KRSFOW. You're listening to The Future of What.
we're talking to John Coombs of Secretly Group. John, welcome to the future of what? Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, I wanted to talk to you guys because, of course, you're doing this very exciting compilation release called Our First Hundred Days, and it's going to coincide with the inauguration (laughs) on the 20th of January. Yep. (laughs) So tell us all, tell all the listeners what Our First Hundred Days is and how they can get it. Yeah. So Our First 100 Days is a compilation. We've partnered with Bandcamp on it, where in a subscription format for a minimum donation of 30 bucks, I will get you all 100 songs. We're doing one song per day for Trump's first 100 days in office. These songs are not necessarily explicitly political, but they're new or unreleased or rare, tough to find tracks from a big slew of artists. Yeah, the artists are sort of from a lot of different places, which I thought was really cool to see. I mean, Mountain Goats and secretly artists like Cherry Glazer. Yeah. But then you have artists from lots of other labels, too. Were they all sort of related? Were they all secretly distro bands or are they from everywhere? No, no. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're from everywhere. They're just, you know, and this is, a, it's a really exciting project. We're thrilled to be a part of this, but it was one outside of the, the actual real work we're doing as far as like raising money for charity. For me personally, it's fun to get to hit up all these artists in, in the independent community that I've always loved and respected, but haven't necessarily had the pleasure of working with to get them involved on it. Yeah, no doubt. So tell us about the inspiration for this. You know, some of us listening are not going to be too shocked that there was an inspiration for (laughs) (laughs) for this, but just go ahead and and, uh, detail it for those other people. Yeah, so I obviously was hoping the election was going to turn out differently. And then the following day, I was walking to lunch and felt this jolt of inspiration, I think, as a lot of people in the music community did, to try and figure out a way to help. And I was like, oh, we, we could do you know one song per day for Trump's first 100 days. And I sat at lunch and I was really inspired by it. And I was firing off emails to everyone at the office to quickly, maybe like 15, 20 minutes, be like, wait a second, I'm pretty sure Jordan and Dave did this with their <laughs> 30 days, 30 songs. This isn't my idea. And I, I called them up and was talking with Jordan. I was like, hey, this is what we're thinking about doing. Would you guys be interested? and they were quick to say yeah so we've partnered with them on it with the 30 days 30 songs with Jordan Kerlin from Zeitgeist Management and Dave Eggers the author and the two big points of differentiation for our campaign is one like I mentioned earlier these songs are not necessarily explicitly political leaning one way or the other two there's a really heavy charitable component so back to this idea that you know for a $30 minimum donation it'll get you all 100 songs that money is going to a few different charities benefiting the climate, reproductive rights, immigration, LGBTQ community, impoverished communities in Southern Indiana, and then RPM, which is a great partner in music for for the music industry, who essentially acts as a middle person between the industry and charities. Yeah, we've spoken to people who've worked with them before, and they're really cool what they do. And I like it in particular because the groups that you guys are sponsoring with this, that you're supporting, are kind of out of left field a little bit. They're not... You know, it's not specifically like Planned Parenthood. And I think that's really cool because everybody kind of immediately thought, or at least many of my friends immediately thought, like, who can we give to? Totally. Who's the right place for us to be putting dollars if we want to register a protest at this time? Yeah. And, you know, a lot of us are sort of like, uh... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know. Yeah. So this is great totally. that you guys have pulled together these organizations so now people at least find out about them and can and can contribute to these directly. That was a large part of the reason we we decided to go with the RPM Jess there, who who's incredible on um, just as, as an incredible lay of the land of different charities. I mean, if you notice, where these charities cover a lot of the same ground that Planned Parenthood does. All all above all, for example, covers reproductive rights. So NRDC, the People's Climate Movement, who who we're working with. So there are a lot of these charities that we're reading about and have been reading about since the day after the election. But a lot of those bigger ones get the majority of the spotlight when when people are wanting to help out. And so we're just trying to help out some smaller ones who need who need just as much help as the bigger ones. Yeah, just sort of philosophically, I mean, I think all of us in the music business sort of always have believed that music can change the world. Yeah. But these days seem kind of dark. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just wonder where are you at with that right now in terms of your personal feelings? Yeah, I, I, I'm back and forth quite a bit. There's some days where I feel like I can't dare look at a screen because chances are I'm going to get infuriated by something that the president-elect has said or that friends or, or family are thinking. And there are other days where I'm in 
incredibly hopeful. It's it's a 50-50 balance, I'd say. But you know, with this project, I'm hoping a, a big goal for us in this was to not further any divide, to not widen any sort of gap between left and right or red and blue. And I'm hoping that this will help achieve that. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that it can serve as some sort of bridge, however small, that we can do that through this project. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I, I totally agree with you. I, I live in a very red area of a blue state. Mm-hmm. And I have some really close friends who are very conservative and all voted for Trump and are all really happy right now right. that he's going into office. And so it's been really educational for me coming from New York City to have this experience and mm-hmm. know these people and care about these people. And I think that's really where this is going to come down to the wires is, is, you know, people understanding that we're actually all in this together yeah, and not allowing us to be divided on basis on the basis of political party. I mean, yeah. so this could be our chance to, to bring ourselves, bring each other together. And I think music is such a wonderful way to do that because it's totally true. It's not on any kind of party lines. You know, people love the same bands regardless of who they voted for. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, what you guys are doing is really cool, and we are excited about it. Yeah, the reaction has been incredible so far. In just the first few days, we're, we're, we're inching towards 20 grand raised already. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, I'm really thrilled with that, you know? And our, our average donation is, is above the $30. I believe it's around 34 bucks. so people are actually spending a little more than we're asking them to, which is always, always a pleasant surprise, especially coming from a music background. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, we're really thrilled. How are you guys dividing it? Are you going to divide it amongst the six or seven charities yeah, just equally? E- evenly. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Yep. That's awesome. And how long is it? Are you going to wait until the 100 days are over and then pay out the money? Is that how that works? Yeah. Well, that's, that's uh, interesting you ask. You know, I think uh, we're, we're toying with the idea of maybe, I think a lot of these charities could use, could use the money up front, especially on the front end before any real damage can get done. And so we're talking about just essentially cutting a check our side, taking a look at where, at where things are going and then getting them some money sooner than later because it would probably be a little more useful on the front end of these first 100 days than on the back end. So yeah, we're, we're, it'll be one or the other. We're trying to figure that out this week. That's fantastic. And you know, that's the best we can do, right, is is try to help people when they need it. Yeah. You know, in on their own terms. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm proud of you guys. Well done. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I mean, so it's, it's awesome to see, you know, the independent community come together for this. I think it was the, the one tiny silver lining the day after the election was just seeing how quickly our corner of music started to mobilize or tons and tons and tons of ideas being thrown around tons of meetings happening and i think we're, we're starting to see a lot of these projects come to fruition like our first hundred days he shows that music hall of williamsburg and, and rough trade the Bowery presents crew along with uh, for william artist management are putting on to benefit the aclu and planned parenthood and i'm hoping i'm hoping that that will continue that's fantastic Do you have any thoughts about potential repeal of the ACA? Just because, I mean, I'm not sure what your experience has been, but in general, the artist community tends to be disproportionately underinsured. Right. And and so I know that there's a chance that this could really hit our community quite hard. Yeah. I mean, it's... It's terrifying. I don't rely on, on that, but I know a lot of, I mean, some of my family, my brother does, mm-hmm. who he works for a company. He's not in music. He's in a different field altogether, but his company does not provide it. It's really terrifying. I and mean, I know half the people, more than half the people I work with, considering the more than half the people I work with are artists or rely on that daily. It's really scary. Yeah. And it's going to affect those of us who, you know, because I'm an employer, so I give healthcare benefits, but Right. The health insurer that we have been using has already announced that they're leaving the market. So it could really, I mean, that's going to be April, right? So we're just like, uh, and we're literally just, you know, giant question mark because we don't know who's going to be in the market. We don't know what right. the the state of the market's going to be. Our price is going to increase 300%. Like we don't know. I find the idea of giving the health insurance companies the benefit of the doubt hilarious. Yeah. Preposterous. Like, oh, give them their own, yeah, give them their head. They'll totally take care of us. Like, what? Right. Right. (laughs) Of course. No, I'm in the same boat. Yeah. So it'll be a a really interesting, this is all going to be very interesting the next hundred and four days or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, John Coombs, thank you very much for being with us today on The Future of What? Appreciate it.
That was Capricornations by Mika Miko. You're listening to The Future of What. We're talking to Jana Hunter of the band Lower Dans. Jana, welcome to The Future of What. Hi, thanks for having me. So our podcast and radio show come out on Fridays, and this Friday is Inauguration Day. So we really wanted to make sure we had something where we talked to musicians about the potential effects of this upcoming slightly unbelievable Trump presidency. So I really wanted to talk to you about what effect you think this is going to have on you as an independent musician. Do you mean in a kind of a a really broad sense, or do you mean in specifically like pertaining to health coverage? Well, I think definitely we want to talk about health coverage because obviously Congress has already said they're starting to repeal the ACA. Yeah. So yeah, let's let's start with that. What what effect would that have on you? It's something it's something of a mystery because they haven't said what if anything they're going to replace it with. Or they I guess they've said we're going to replace it, but given those specifics, I can only imagine that it means going back to what it was like prior to the ACA, which was in my case not having health insurance and just kind of hoping not to get sick and paying an arm and a leg for the prescriptions that I have to have to be a you know, functioning person. So the ACA actually changed that for you? I mean, you you pretty much were in a in the same in that boat that we find a lot of musicians in prior to the ACA where you just didn't have health coverage and you had to pay out of your pocket for expensive prescriptions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so wouldn't go see a doctor, you know, wouldn't you know, unless it unless it seemed imminently life threatening wouldn't even bother to try to find a doctor who didn't have a like a primary care physician for my entire my entire adult life you know the few instances that I've had to go see somebody because of it you know whatever extreme pain or something I just I end up going to the ER which is it's just not a way to it's just not a way to live taking those kinds of risks but you know you accept what you have to do Right. So what did the Affordable Care Act allow you to do? Like, how did your life change with that, with the ACA? Well, I I went for checkups. It gives one a significant kind of peace of mind, knowing that you're not going to drop dead <laughs> at any moment unexpectedly. Yes, that's good. And then, you know, I also happened to have a couple of occasions where I really, really needed a doctor. And I went you know, I went to a doctor and I got treated and and they were very difficult illnesses. And thinking about it in, in retrospect, I really don't think that I would have gone to a doctor until a much later time. And in at least one of those cases really could have ended up with me, like, if not dead, like significantly more ill and kind of out of commission for a much longer period of time. And generally a lot poorer because... <laughs> Because of the medications that I take and how much they cost when there's, you know, more than a copay to cover. Because, you know, they're just ridiculous. Anything is, like any kind of medication, just insane how much they charge for those things. Yeah, it's incredible. And you find out really quickly, we have health care, but it, my son got really sick last year and we took him to our local hospital. And it just happened that our local hospital was not in our network. So we ended up having to pay the hospital charges out of our pocket. And it was crazy, first of all, how many charges there were, Yeah. you know, and I mean, obviously how much they were, but just, you know, it was like you have to pay the doctor who saw him in the emergency room and you have to pay the person who came to see him when he was in a regular room. I mean, it was like, it was, it was shocking. And so, I mean, I think everyone is, you know, I, I don't really understand the notion that going back to how things were before the ACA is in any way acceptable because I don't think that health insurers have us in their heads. (laughs) Like, I don't think they're out there doing their very best for us, you know, to make costs lower. I mean, I think we have a very bizarre system in this country. You know, we're one of the only countries, if not the only country where health insurance people get to determine whether or not you should receive a certain treatment rather than a doctor. Yeah. It, it seems to have been a sort of un, on, uh, like not a widely acknowledged 
saying that, that the only people that want it to be like that are people who stand to benefit financially from it. And there are a lot of people who are, I mean, if you read articles about it, there's a lot of people who voted for the incoming administration who knew that that was part of the platform and assumed that it was just talk, that it wouldn't happen, and and are now facing losing what little, you know, what little coverage they do have entirely when they already don't have jobs and you know, like yeah. all the economic anxiety stuff that we, that we heard about, like all of those voters uh, don't want the ACA repealed. Yeah. You know, they, they aren't being represented either. Yeah. It's a really frightening precipice that I feel like we're trembling on at this moment. Yeah. And, you know, musicians as a whole are disproportionately un or underinsured as a group. And I think that's partially because musicians jobs are so weird like the job of being an independent musician is kind of odd like you don't have anyone like there's no boss so you can't you know you don't have like a company that you work for I mean even if you were on a major label you wouldn't have you know like health care coming from someone else yeah and then the job is very it's seasonal it's sporadic you know some of the time you're writing a record you're in the studio a lot of the time you're out on the road. I mean, in a way, it's almost more hazardous to be a working musician than to be, you know, someone who has a regular nine to five job. Yeah, absolutely. You say there's no boss. And what that means is that you're entirely responsible for yourself. and put puts you in this like ridiculous position. I mean, from, from the vantage point of, of even just like the, the creative side of music, the kind of reading between the lines, the assumed goal then of being a musician is to make money. And and therefore not to, not to express <laughs> not to express yourself, but to find out what your audience wants and write for them. It's such a weird it's such a weird anti-intuitive way of being to begin with, and then to add to that. Oh, and also no doctors for you. <laughs> <laughs> you go out and entertain us, but no healthcare for you. <laughs> yeah, not until you start proving that you know what we want. That's right. That's right. That's an interesting way to think about it too. Yeah, I just, I feel like this is a really a scary moment. I'm also talking on this episode to Kevin Erickson, who runs the Future Music Coalition, and they're in D.C., and they have a, you know, for years sort of been successful in having kind of a nonpartisan approach to talking about music business industries with people in the government. And I think one of the scariest things about the Trump administration is that going into this, we actually have just nothing but questions. Like we don't actually have any policies. We don't know where he stands on a lot of issues that are going to be really important for musicians. Like, I mean, net neutrality is one that comes to mind Yeah. like immediately as, as a huge deal. I I don't know if you have any other thoughts per se on that (laughs) or some other topic regarding the incoming government that you might want to touch on. I mean, um, making anything that that is uh, in any way like true to myself means a, a certain amount of like uh, picking and choosing what in the world I allow to in, in influence that writing. You know, because if I'm running my band's Facebook page and participating in social media forums about politics, everything that I get to make is going to be like 100 percent nauseating anxiety. <laughs> And in, and in order to avoid that, I try to filter a lot, but also with the, with the knowledge that that's not a, a long-term solution by any means. So right now I'm trying to make as much music as I can without worrying about too much of that because it's out, you know, as far as I, as far as I know, it's like essentially out of my control. I did what I could and I participated in the election and, and encouraged people to vote for Bernie Sanders. And then it went this way. And I don't know what's going to, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. But somebody told me a story a long time ago about you go on a uh, Hawaiian vacation, like the three days before your vacation, you're incredibly excited. You, you know, you might be like going about the like mundane tasks of, of uh, your normal life, but you're really excited because, you know, Hawaii is on the horizon. And then you get to Hawaii in the last three days of your vacation. All you can think about is like the drudgery that you have to, <laughs> you have to return to. <laughs> so I'm trying to be present in the moment so that I don't think about how like the vacation is over, you know, <laughs> and this is the, uh, the end of what we, what we thought of as limited freedom, but we don't even know what that meant, you know? Interesting. Can you tell me more about what you think about that? I think a lot about what motivates people and it, and it frightens me a lot. What I think motivates the current administration and it frightens me even more 
the uh, kind of like sycophantic behavior of the GOP as regards that administration and the like rewriting of language that's happening, both coming from that administration and in response to it from the, the press who already kind of adapting a kind of a more prescriptive approach to the commenting on the state of things rather than, than a descriptive approach. I, t- I tend to look at all those kinds of things and feel very generally pessimistic. But as far as that impacts me personally, I don't, it's, too, it's almost just like too much for me to really, to, to, to think about. I worry about what it's doing to my, you know, my relationships with my conservative family members. And I, and I worry about a lot of that, like divisiveness and people so motivated by greed that they like take all choice away from other people without them even knowing it. You know, like abstract ideas like that, that I think are really coming to fruition, but really difficult to grasp and even more difficult to act against without kind of abandoning the rest of your life for like political strategy. I feel like I'm talking like an insane person, but this is <laughs> this is what happens to me when I start thinking about it, you know? Yeah, I think a lot of people are feeling that way. I know I feel that way. I, I like what you said about, you know, how do we get through this without damaging our relationships with our conservative family and friends? And I feel like that's something that I would like to focus on is the points of unity. There has to be at some point, you know, common ground where there are things that we all hold dear. I think the thing that's scaring me the most is how much of, you know, I think the people who voted for Trump assume that it's going to be a 99.9% business as usual and maybe 0.1% weird Trump stuff and that we're just going to stay the same and America is just going to move forward and everybody's going to get up in the morning and eat their Wheaties and Cheerios and everything's going to be totally normal. And, oh yeah, Trump says some weird stuff, but like really nothing's going to change. And my fear is like, I think change is going to happen and I think it's going to happen a lot faster than that. But I just wonder when people are going to pay attention. Uh, Yeah. Like historically, that's the prevailing mood prior to any impending regime change. People assume, (laughs) you know, like, oh, that's too crazy. That's why would anybody do that? It doesn't make any sense. But they are not really putting themselves in the position of somebody who is motivated solely by like power and greed and, and having as much of that as possible in the now and thinking like, what will that person do to have that? Especially when they've already had it their whole lives and they now are wielding like much more powerful reins. I think it's really hard for us to think like that. And I think you're right. I think that kind of the only possibility is that, that it will be, very different from what most of us imagine and that it will happen much faster than most of us will imagine and that it will take us, you know, by the time that we are motivated to action, it'll be already like well underway and, you know, past, past the point of, uh, of return. Yeah. I just, I mean, I know this is totally not what we should be talking about or doing, but you know, my, my mind keeps going to like, the normal German people who were interviewed about, you know, do you know that there's a train that passes your house that takes Jews to a concentration camp? And they go, they would say, oh, no, that's not where that train goes. You know, I mean, that like people were just completely in denial about the reality of what was actually happening. And I feel like yeah, I'm terrified because I feel like that could happen here so easily. We've already decided that the media lies. Like, did you notice how that happened in five minutes? Like now everyone's like, oh, everything you see on the news is fake. It's now all called fake news. Yeah. So you, now you can't believe anything that any of the news outlets say. Yeah. So what do you believe? I mean, it just becomes instantly like, so there's pictures of people dying in the streets. Oh, those aren't real. That's just fake news. Yeah. Like, where do we go from here? I'm completely panicking. <laughs> I'm sorry. This interview has just totally gone down the drain. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, uh, how can it not? Like, how can we not talk about this stuff? <laughs> you know, like the Nazis invented propaganda, but we perfected it and we've been doing it for decades. We're so primed. For, yeah. for that kind of behavior. And yeah, there's another, there was a quote that I, I tried in conversation with, with one of my family members who, uh, who voted for Trump, you know, that I, uh, I think that like the son of a Holocaust survivor saying the nicest people make the best Nazis. Ugh. Yeah. Because they are the ones who, who are, can be so powerfully in, in denial. And I know I'm not getting that quote right. I don't really want to find it and send it to you, but it, but I mean, you get my point. Totally. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, and that's what it seems like. You know, I these conservative friends that I have are lovely, lovely people who really do care about others, but somehow they didn't have any problem with anything Trump said. <laughs> just yeah, like I, you know, my brain just melts at that point. I don't know. Yeah, I think now would be a great time for us to get invaded by aliens and taken over. That's what I think. I was I was thinking that too. I can't remember what movie I was watching. Oh, I was watching that terrible Independence Day yeah. sequel. <laughs> yeah. And thinking, and thinking, and it was it was like the you know the second aliens invade movie that I'd seen in a while, and just you know, just being pounded over the head with the idea that like the only way humans come together is that we have like a a foe we have to face together. Right. There's, you know, there's there's no other possibility except for us to band together. That's the only way that we survive. I don't want to believe that that's true, but I don't know if it matters because I do think that a lot of people believe that that's true because they don't trust each other, you know? And, and I mean, I feel like that's what it boils down to with the kind of isolationism and panicky greed that is, you know, in, in the administration and the air right now is that there's just a complete void of trust of your fellow human being. Yeah, there's a lack of trust and there's also a bizarre feeling of scarcity. It's like everybody is trying to grab the last gold coins. You know what I mean? And it's like, really? It, what happened? Did I miss something? Is this it? This is this is the last pile of money that exists and we have to grab all the rest of it. But I guess that's the the end the end game of capitalism at some point. Yeah. Perfect growth. Yeah. Perfect growth. Yeah. Capitalism slash cancer. Same goal. Yeah. Same goal. Well, on that fabulous upbeat note, <laughs> John Hunter, it really has been a pleasure to talk to you today. You too. On the future of what? Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.
That was Have Mercy by Tutan Boa. You're listening to The Future of What? If you're enjoying this program, like us on Facebook and become a subscriber on iTunes. And that's our show. The music we played today was used by permission. You heard Erase Arata, Mika Miko, Tutan Boa, and of course our theme song, Mind Your Own Business by the Delta Five. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. For more info on our shows, check out our website at killrockstars.com slash the future of what. Our program was engineered by Brent Asbury at Beta Petrol and is produced by Will Watts and Anna McLean. I'm Portia Sabin, president of Kill Rockstars. See you next week. <laughs>